Hay también otra... Another argument goes like this. Let us suppose there is an agreement. In other words, that the depositor gives his consent for the banker to use the money as if it were a loan. Well, to begin with, we would have to find out whether the depositor had given explicit and informed consent. And I very much doubt all depositors are fully conscious of having explicitly authorized the bank to use their money as a loan, thus endangering its immediate availability. But even if that were the case, even if all depositors had given their consent to this practice and were aware of it, does it have a legal basis? Can this type of contract be carried out? It is as monstrous as saying, by contract I authorize you to deceive me. It is like signing a contract that legitimizes self-deception. In other words, I am placing this with you on demand deposit, but you can use it. Just remember, I am making a demand deposit. I may show up at any time and withdraw it, but I authorize you to not have it. That is ontologically impossible. It is no use saying people are unaware and they give their consent. Give their consent to what? It is like the comparison I made the other day, based on the view of Luis Saravia de la Calle. I am handing over my daughter to you for safekeeping and for the guarding of her virginity. But you must put her to work on the street as a prostitute, because I expect her to bring in a thousand euros a night. But take care. She must not lose her virginity. Well, such a contract is ontologically impossible. Luis Saravia de la Calle writes that depositing money with someone who will not guard it is just as impossible and absurd as turning over a virgin to a lecher for safekeeping, as we saw the other day. It is an absolutely self-contradictory contract, because the causes are incompatible. And there is no use saying that what bankers do is no secret, and therefore depositors give explicit or tacit authorization. Let us consider another example. Do you know what the Coralito was in Argentina? Well, Argentina resorted to de facto dollarization. The country began using the dollar as its national currency, and banks began accepting deposits in dollars. There was only one problem. Argentina had no central bank that could print dollars, since it is the US Federal Reserve that prints dollars. Argentine banks operated with a fractional reserve ratio. As soon as there was a trigger or crisis of confidence, people went en masse to the windows of private banks to withdraw their dollars, but they were gone, since banks had been operating with a fractional reserve and had lent most of the money to third parties. The Coralito was the result. What did the Coralito mean? It meant a law came out stating, we permit banks to refrain from returning your deposits. How did Argentine citizens respond? Do you remember what happened? This was during the time of Cavallo, a few years back. Well, there was practically a revolution. People took to the streets and protested around the clock. They were outraged and looted department stores. And they had a point, because their money had been taken from them. It was as if you went to the bank to withdraw your thousand euros, and the banker said, sorry, I don't have the money. It was a lot like the trading card swindle. Those who yelled the loudest and did the most looting had been the first to be delighted when they originally made their deposits and asked to be paid interest in return. Are the depositors not also guilty, in a sense? When depositors explicitly or tacitly accept interest payments from the banker, what they are doing in practice is recognizing that the banker is appropriating a large portion of the money deposited and lending it out. So, depositors are guilty, because they know they are accepting a monstrous, contradictory practice, which violates the deposit contract. But the subjective cause of custody and safekeeping, of maintaining availability, prevails. And when depositors go to withdraw their money, it is gone. It is as if the guardian returned my daughter, and when I learned she was no longer a virgin, I became furious with him. You scoundrel! This is inconceivable! Did I not tell you to guard the maiden? Sure, but you looked the other way when I paid you a thousand euros each day, and you didn't ask where the money was coming from. Just what was the girl doing? What line of work was she in? Do you see what I mean? 
The sin carries its own penance. So what is the trading card swindle, which is also closely related to our topic, this monstrous contract in which the deposit is confused with the loan? Well, it goes like this. An apparently mentally handicapped person walks down the street saying, I have some cards, and waving around a bundle of 500 euro bills. My cards, my cards, I want to exchange them. A man passing by says, I'll give you something for them. And there is always someone in on the trick. Damn, he's got 2,500 euro bills here, and he says he'll trade them for any card. That is when the poor guy who falls for it says, hell, what does he want for them? Whatever you give me, a 20 euro bill. Damn, how much have you got? Well, I've got 3,000 euros at home in 20 euro bills, but there are at least a million euros here. Well, hell, let's go. The sucker falls for it, but think about it. Who is the biggest villain here? Let us think objectively. Who is it? The swindler or the swindled? Obviously, the biggest villain is the man swindled because he comes upon a mentally handicapped person with real money, hears that he wants to exchange it for practically nothing and tries to take advantage of the handicapped person. Is that legitimate behavior? The idiot goes home, takes out his savings and hands over two or three thousand euros in exchange for what he supposes to be two thousand five hundred euro bills. The other two men run away and when the sucker looks, he finds only papers in the envelope. And oh, how embarrassing it is to have to go to the police station to report that one has been the victim of the trading card swindle. Because the one who should go to jail is the victim, at least for the attempt to deceive a mentally handicapped person, even if the whole thing was a setup. No, no, don't laugh. Just remember, everything that seems too easy in life is a trick and a lie. Dear students, do not let yourselves be deceived. Anyone who rings your doorbell or walks into your business to offer you a fantastic deal is trying to trick you. In life, whenever anything seems too good to be true, it is. Take care or you will be deceived. Everything in life takes effort and sacrifice. Is that clear? So, if a fabulous, gorgeous girl who is also a paragon of virtue invites you into bed on your first date, beware. Do not accept. The same is true of guys. Watch out. There is no doubt about it. Do not laugh. I am telling the truth. You must not be naive. The same is true when someone says, listen, I've got a fantastic deal for you. I'll hold and safeguard your money on deposit. It will be at your disposal at all times. And on top of that, instead of your paying me for safekeeping services, I am going to pay you interest. And the guy jumps for joy. Finally, someone generous and good. Or as Tomás de Mercado writes of civilian bankers who receive deposits of money, those of this city, it is true, are so regal and noble, they ask for and take no wage. They even paid interest. Do not be a fool. Such depositors are allowing themselves to be deceived and the contract is null and void. So, what was that about an unspoken or implicit agreement? Even if such an agreement exists, in no way does it detract from the fact that the essential cause is safekeeping. And if you do not believe me, you have the illustration of the Coralito and the indignation of those affected. Furthermore, the causes are totally incompatible with each other. That contract is inconceivable because it is ontologically impossible. That is why I write on page 116 that even if such an agreement existed, the supposed authorization would be irrelevant because it would be incompatible with the contract's purpose and therefore as legally null and void as any contract in which one of the parties authorizes the other to deceive him or accepts in writing self-deception to his own detriment. So far, we have covered the first set of doctrines. Nowadays, most, if not all, jurists and experts in the field recognize that the deposit contract is one thing and the loan contract is quite another, and the two cannot be combined.